Okay. Um, before I start, I want to share something. Um, when Pascal was preaching, I was just thinking of something. Um, I had a vision in my third year in Ife. I went to Ife. Um, I went to sports center to pray, as was my custom every night. So I had this thing um, God told me to do my last two years in school, um, to, to cross over the day with him. So every 11 to 12, I would start the new day with God. So I would go to sports center and pray and then walk back to my room. I mean, if I was relatively safe then, you know, I don't know how it is now. So I had this vision and I was in a room, a very dark room. And it was so dark, I couldn't see myself. That's how dark the room was. You know, no matter how dark a room is, you will still be able to see yourself somewhere. I couldn't see myself, it was pitch black. And then from nowhere, it seems like someone handed me a light. And then I was holding that candle, and then somehow other people started to take from, I know, that's how I knew that there were other people in the room. They started taking from the light, and then the light started spreading. And then I could see that in that room, it was more like a stadium full of women so pretty much like the light I was carrying, you know, was the light from which all these other people were now lighting their own candles and lighting other people's candles. And I just saw that it was a sea of people. And I knew clearly that God wanted to use me to do ministry. And as Pastor Gay was preaching, I sat there just thinking to myself, what if I had married a man who quenched that light? Because most of the things that I do today is because I stand on the shoulders of someone who was bold to push me out there, even when I didn't want to. And this is one of the reasons why I will keep shouting, keep preaching, keep screaming to single girls especially. And the reason why I speak to girls especially is because you have the first right of choice. A man can propose, now he gets his mouth, if he tell you anything. But it is your right to say yes or no. You determine who you attach yourself to. Most women don't marry by gunpoint. However, so many women are willing to sacrifice their destinies on the altar of marriage. You throw away your destiny. I could have done that. I could have married a man that would just close my light. As he was preaching, I just had a flash and a memory of it. And I just said, this is why we do what we do. This is why we will come here as God allows us every year. To remind you that you have a choice. And God is counting on you to make the right choice. So tonight, I, I just want to share a few things. Our theme is marriage on the rock. Um, but I also want to, I want to draw your attention to the kind, not just where to build, but the kind of thing to build. God is interested in your marriage. God is interested in your home. A lot of times we think it's just about us. And yesterday I tried to paint a picture to you. That yes, God wants you to fall in love. God wants you to have the marriage of your dreams. God wants you to have amazing sex, to have vacations, to do everything. God wants all of that. But the real thing that is his own is the godly seed that you produce from that marriage. And so God is just as invested in your marriage as you are. And that's why the Bible says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. Someone came to me a few months ago and said she wanted to, to get a divorce. And I said to her, I don't have a problem with your getting a divorce. No. I'm not even against you. If you want to get a divorce, very good. However, you will do one thing for me. She said anything. I said, good. When you were getting married, you called God and said, come and be a witness to our marriage. When you were saying I do, he was the person, the witness, and he was the third person. And she said yes. I said, so you go and ask him now whether you divorce this union. She said, oh, oh. I said, what's oh now? She he was on his own. You went and said, this is the man I want to do with. Come and join us. Now you cannot separate yourself. Every time you try to, it's like when they are plating hair, braid. If you are trying to separate yourself, there's one that we still join you people together. Even if you do like this, go your two separate ways. There's one, the one in the middle, we still join you people. If you braid it, you understand what I'm talking about. So for some of us, we've forgotten that when you make those vows, you are not just promising each other. You are promising God. You are saying, I will do. So when you want to end it, you have to ask God as well. And most of you know what God will say, right? Let's read <laughs> Luke 8. I'll start from Luke 8. Luke 8 from verse 4 to 15. I'm reading the message translation. 
It says, as they went from town to town, a lot of people joined in and traveled along. And he addressed them using this story. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Some of it fell on the road. It was trampled down and birds ate it. Other seed fell in the gravel. It sprouted but withered because it didn't have good roots. Other seed fell in the weeds. The weeds grew with it and strangled it. And other seed fell in rich earth and produced a bumper crop. Are you listening to this? Really listening? His disciples asked, why did you tell us this story? He said, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. You know how it works. There are others who need stories, but even with stories, some of them are still not going to get it. Their eyes are open, but they don't see a thing. Their ears are open, but they don't hear a thing. This story is about some of those people. And he began to explain. He said, the seed is the word of God. The seeds on the road are those who hear the word. But no sooner do they hear it than the devil snatches it from them so they won't believe and be saved. The seeds in the gravel are those who hear with enthusiasm. But the enthusiasm doesn't go very deep. It's only another fad. And at the moment there's trouble, it's gone. And the seed that fell in the weeds, well... These are the ones who hear, but then the seed is crowded out and nothing comes of it as they go about their lives, worrying about tomorrow, making money and having fun. But the seed in the good earth, these are the good hearts who seize the word and hold on no matter what, sticking with it until there's a harvest. As I was reading, I was meditating on the scripture earlier today. It occurred to me that there are four kinds of people also in marriages i know the scripture is about i mean most times when we preach it we talk about how you you know this is describing the heart of man and all of that but then the Holy Spirit began to show me that there are four kinds of people you can see here also concerning marriage the first kind of people are the ones on the road where the seed now the seed is the word of god and god has already told us what marriage should be marriage is a good thing if marriage was not a good thing, God would have told us. I've not read any scripture that describes marriage as bad. Everywhere you search in the scripture, it says that it is not good for man to be alone. In other words, it is gooder for man to be married. It says that marriage is honorable in all things. He that finds a wife finds a good thing. Two are better than one, which means they are gooder than one. So everywhere you look in the scripture, no matter what version you read, the Bible tells us that marriage is good. So God has declared that marriage is good. However, the people that encounter this word that God has said marriage is good are different. So the first set of people, they're the ones that hear that marriage is good, they're on the road. But they, before they've even started the marriage, they are the ones that Pasquale described as the ones that have received generational foolishness. The ones that their parents, their culture, People that have decided that, oh, it's culture that will determine this marriage. They are destined to fail even before they start. When you grow up in a family where they believe that women should be seen and not heard. Women are forgiving births. They are a woman's place is in the kitchen. And then you continue to pass that on. If you marry a woman, especially a woman of this generation, who is on social media and has said about feminism, that marriage has already failed before it started. If you marry a non-believer, Satan is already, you see, you see what I love about that scripture? It says that as the seed fell, the birds came and took it. The birds took it like people that know that this seed on this floor, it did not fall inside seed, so it's my own. It's the same way Satan knows those that are his. The way Satan will attack an unbeliever with confidence, he, he will eat them like he's his own. He doesn't take permission, he doesn't, you know, there's a way, and, you know, there's a way Satan will approach you as a believer who knows his rights. He will not approach you with his full chest. He will confess. Did God really say? And he will move back. It's you that will not say, God, when you answer him like that, like we are friends, he will not come forward and say, oh yeah, now. You see that fruit? You smell it. You now do. It smells nice. You will not say, oh yeah, lick it. You will not do. It tastes nice. It doesn't go into your mouth. Oh yeah, bite it. Then go and give your husband. You see, those are the things people don't understand. There's a way that Satan will enter your home is because you gave him permission to. And those marriages are already destined to fail. 
So he said that those first kind, though, they are the ones that, before they even started marriage has failed. The second one are the ones that, yes, they fell on ground. But you see, the thing about them is that once they grew with the weeds, the weeds strangled them. You know what those weeds are? Little problems in life. And because this generation, we don't really have stamina. Uh, uh, Pastor, Pastor Sunday was talking about it a few minutes ago. You know, when we're growing up, they'll give us chloroquine. I don't know, I know not many people in my generation, Sha, that drank chloroquine. You know that if they even tell, if you have malaria and they tell you they're going to give you chloroquine, you will be well. <laughs> because the, the, the memory of the last one that you drank, the way you remember how you were scratching and it's always itching in places you cannot scratch. <laughs> and places I possibly cannot mention. That's how chloroquine does. You understand? And that's how we were raised. If you've never drank chloroquine before, you will not understand. In fact, when they give chloroquine for the first time, you don't start scratching you. The bitterness of chloroquine will heal your soul, your spirit, and your body of malaria. Then the itching starts. And the itching is part of it. It's as if the itching is, is telling you that so you don't have sense. You want to, you want to be mad, Abby, or you be mad. You want to be sick. You want to stress your parents. But you know what happens now? They now give them chloroquine that is sugar-coated. So even when they taste, they don't even know. You understand? They just taste. So that's how this generation is now. Everything, if they can't, see, don't, don't take it. Your mental health can't take it. You, you can't. Don't, don't deal. You can't deal. See, you can't kill yourself. You can't kill yourself. If it's not working, it's not working. Well, please, that's your parents' generation, no. Who good, good game, no, they pay. Who good game, help. You be all those kind of things. So when there's a little challenge, and let me tell you, there's no marriage that will not have challenges. Now, I didn't say that there will not, there, I'm saying there won't be challenges. It doesn't have to be, the challenges don't have to be between the two of you. They can be external challenges. We've been quite, through quite a lot of our own. When we got married, we have money. That was an external challenge. I could have said, I'm done. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Really. Because ordinarily, I'm not supposed to come. <laughs> because my parents that raised me, they raised me as a jabota. I don't know that people believe for school fees. I don't know that people believe. I don't know. My prayer is, Jesus, I just love you. Thank you, Jesus. For saying, I, don't, I don't know this. I'm believing God for you. I believe in God. I, don't, I didn't know it. So if I have a, a problem, I write a list. It was simple. That's how I was raised. So to now enter husband's house, and the man said, we use faith. What's that, sir? <laughs> I know understanding, though. <laughs> and when I was getting married, my parents bought everything that you would need, right? He gave me everything that I would need. He gave me, you know, all the kitchen utensils, everything you would need, microwave, deep freezer, gas cooker. I go to my husband's house. We could not buy a gas cylinder. So gas cooker was looking at us. We were looking at seeds. We could not buy a cylinder. My husband had decided to teach me how to use stove. <laughs> Ordinarily, as the man, the man was teaching me, oh, one day I now went to do I didn't do the week. They said there's a way you do week. They did not teach me in my father's house. I now went to do the week. And on the, it now exploded in my face. And honestly, that day, I should have said I can't. <laughs> because the... The way the smoke landed on my face, I sat on the floor and started crying. My husband was laughing. <laughs> because I was saying to myself, what's all this? What's all this? One phone call to my daddy. What's all this? Why do I want to disgrace my husband? What's all this? I was just thinking in my head. And my husband was just laughing like, which kind of job I go carry God and make? <laughs> this generation, little thing, I'm out. I stayed there. And we managed ourselves. After that one, children did not come. We said that journey again. I could have said I can't. I really, because I really can't. <laughs> because you see this mental health, it's all of us that have it too. <laughs> it's just that you people in this generation, you act as if it's your own. <laughs> eh? They act as if all of us have the mental health, all of us. No, 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 I can't stand the way she spoke to me. My mother-in-law just spoke to me like that. No, 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 no. No, because I'm marrying her son. No, I can't. I really, Pastor M, I'm unable to con. <laughs> I just, 
this. Your mother-in-law will sort you. Tell her, yes, ma. Thank you, ma. That's how we're brought up. Small stamina like this. That's the second set. And you let me tell you what the weeds are. The weeds are social media. That's, that's what's growing with this generation. Everything. Somebody that's in her house, she kneels down. In fact, what am I saying? On all fours. I husband will now put plate on the back and eat. We come on social media and say, men has come. I will not take this from any man. You too. You will follow her to be shouting, men has come. You will not take it. In her house, she's taking it and she will keep taking it. And then after telling you people rubbish, they will not enter Pastor K's DM. Sir, I'm having problems in my marriage. Please, sir, come and help me. I said, Pastor K, no be. Pastor K say, eh, she needs help. I see. Have the mask and grab this thing. <laughs> I need, as in, and they don't ever come to me. I don't know why. And I can I'm very helpful. I can help them. <laughs> they won't come to me. <laughs> no stamina. The weeds quickly choked it up as they grew together. That's what social media is doing. The Bible will say something. The word God has said. Social media will come and tell you another thing. You will take social media will strangle the word of God in you. God say, husband, love your wife. Social media will say, you better keep your money with your mother. It'd be like saying, no get sense. Or the Bible will say, wives, submit to your husband. Social media will tell you, in this generation, are you a slave? Why will you submit to a man? The weeds are growing together with you and they are strangling you. You see, those kind of marriages that don't, you don't have strong decisions. You haven't made strong agreements. You know, that's one of the things that really has helped our marriage. The fact that we had very strong agreements from the very beginning. From the very first time that we decided we we're going to get married, we had some basic agreements that we will not quarrel. We will not fight. We will not insult each other. No matter how angry you are, you don't have a right to insult me. If you are losing your temper, lose it another place. Not my body you lose. You can't beat me. You can't. Because I'm your partner. I didn't come to this marriage as your slave. We had agreements that we, we, we exchanged parents. So anything being done in my side of the family by us is him. I'll say, oh, Pastor Keith said I should send this. Pastor Keith said I should do this. On his family as well. We do the same thing. Anything that you, I do for um, his mom, anything he does, whether he's the one that does it or I do he tells his mom, I'm the one that did it. I'm the one that sends her money every month. He's the one that sent my mom. You know, we had certain agreements that somehow, we had an agreement that you, nobody leaves the house without kissing each other. Yes, you can't leave the house. Just imagine being angry. I'm going. <laughs> I'll go stand where, which kind of, is that one kiss? Kiss somebody where, Joe? You like be angry. You will see that it will dissolve. We agreed that we will not have separate bedrooms. You divest, you'll go your room. You're angry, be lie down there with me. My body just, I put it back. <laughs> Nonsense. You're my husband, your body's not your own. <laughs> See, all those things, all those things, they may seem like they seem like harmless, but in the midst, and you must be willing, that's why I say strong decisions, you must be willing to stick to those agreements. You must be willing. No matter how angry you are, you don't disrespect each other. You don't do that. The third one. <laughs> That's the one that fell. Oh, sorry, the second one, I made a mistake. The second one is the one that fell on gravel. The third one is the one that falls weeds. That's the one that distraction. You get busy with work. Or children come. Many people don't know children can be a distraction in marriage. Ah, when children start coming like this. It will be as if, and you know children, they don't have respect, Sha. They don't have respect. I'm sorry. That's why the Bible says you should train them. They don't have respect. After you have done everything, you have carried them and you put them in bed. This is just one example of their disrespect. Then you now say, tonight is your night, bro. <laughs> and you get into bed. And you just want to kiss your husband. You just get, <laughs> <laughs> Or if they are toddlers, they will just come like, be rubbing eye. I just enter your middle. What? Who are you? <laughs> distractions, different kinds of distractions. 
you may start looking for money. Uh, if you don't have money in my money, see, money is good in my Maybe one day, I don't know, maybe when we come again, we'll teach on finances in marriage. Money is essential in marriage. As much as you love each other, do you know you cannot use love to pay school fees? They don't collect love as house rent. You can't just say, oh, landlord say, I've not collected. Oh, say, we've alerted you. You didn't get your alert. It's a love. It's a love. We love the remnants of our love we sent into your account. No. Your pay complete. So when you start chasing money like that, somehow you may forget each other. And that's, that's, what, that's, that's the one thing that people don't realize marriage. You can be in a marriage, be in love with each other, and still stray. Like both of you can just go your separate ways. Because you are not consciously working together. So this one fell in weeds. Worry, kids' school fees, house rents, uh, different things. I didn't get visa, so my body is biting me. Different things can just destroy a good marriage. And the truth is that you can genuinely love each other. Genuinely. The last one is the one that I really want to focus on tonight. And that's the one where the seed fell on good ground. And that good ground, when the seed fell on good ground, it said it produced exactly what the sower had in mind. Some, in fact, some versions say it blew the sower's mind. It produced 30, 60, and a hundredfold sometimes. So God has a plan concerning marriage. So whether it is that you are growing your marriage together, or that you are building your marriage, whatever it is, you have to start with the word, which is what the sower went out to sow. My question to you tonight is, what are you sowing into your relationship? What are you sowing into your marriage? Are you sowing into it the word of God? I am such a stickler for the word. I believe that it is the word of God that can create whatever you want. And that's one of the reasons also why I am so particular about teaching people how to pray the word of God. So many people pray out of emotions. And emotions don't change anything. Especially because the person you are dealing with is a spirit. God is touched by the feelings of your infirmity. He's touched by emotions. But he's not emotional now. I don't know how many people have ever gone to court. I know there are lawyers here. Uh, Pastor Philip is a lawyer now. Uh -huh. You've, have you gone to court and you and while they are there, the other person has said this is this according to this law and this law and this, this is what the person did. Then the nurse come and defend the person, you start crying. <laughs> and the judge will now say, Ah, oh, can a man even be crying like this? Oh, yeah, you will case dismissed. Never. And whatever you see on the earth is a picture of what is in heaven. So the same way he will go with this case, this person versus this person as his example. And this subsection versus, so, my father would be crying right now. Like, this is why I said you are really low. Now you don't know anyone. This is what you do at being caught. So why do you think that when you want to approach God, you don't have to quote back to him? Genesis chapter this, verse this, subsection this. Your word says this. This is the law. You have to put the law back to him. So all those crying, you are crying in marriage. It's not bringing anything. No. It's not changing anything. But no, you might me. Go to the word. And look for a man you want your husband to be like. Then you will now open the scriptures and you will declare that man over your, your, uh, over your husband. This was, I see, I see I've, done, I've done this thing. I don't know. I, I, my own is not here. This is one thing that has helped our marriage tremendously. What are you sowing into your marriage? Too many people are complaining about their spouses, but you're not sowing anything. Every day you go to the... the, the, the the land and you will rake it. You will weed it. What are you sowing? Nothing will grow. No matter how much you rake it, no matter how much you weed it, nothing will grow. What are you putting in the ground? Some people are even, their own is even bad. Because they are not putting in the word. You are a useless man. Your angel will help you to press it down so that it can grow. Useless man, you will never amount to anything. I know that's, you are sowing. You are sowing. Your words are seeds. You are sowing. I don't even know what they do with this useless man. You have declared he's a useless man, but you are still there. You are a witch, and you expect her behavior to be good. 
The Bible tells us that whatsoever Adam called them was what they became. So whatever you call your partner, whatever you call your marriage, whatever you call your home is what it will become. This is why I went out to sow the seed. What seed are you sowing? What seed are you sowing? The word of God is God giving us actual tools to use to build the life that we want. So many people think that when it comes to love and relationship, that was emotional, let's keep it aside. Your marriage is more spiritual than it is emotional, in case you don't know. So half the time we go out there and say, oh, as far as we're in love, as far as when we look into each other's eyes, butterflies we, you know, are tell me, as far as when he, the sun rises in his eyes and sets in his nose, all those, all those things, you know, and the man will be telling you all kinds of stupid things. I see my baby in your eyes, you see me. <laughs> You never know, know whether if he born. <laughs> Listen. Marriage is more spiritual than it is physical. Sometimes for no reason. You know, I, I run a ministry for women trusting God for the fit of the womb. And sometimes they will call me and say, every time I'm ovulating, me and my husband were always quarreling. Every time we've every time I've noticed, every time I say, so you have noticed that every time you have ovulating, Satan is beating drum for you. Why are you dancing? Are you not? Eh? So every time my mind wonder, I'll be begging him. Yes. Yes. Now you won't be king. Nobody won't get belay. So you know that once it is time for you to ovulate, then you'll be quarreling about nonsense things. Then refuse to quarrel. Make up your mind. Be intentional about it. That no matter what this man tells me, we will not quarrel. <laughs> Say my quarrel will not quarrel. Are you an answer to mom? <laughs> so what are you sowing? What are you sowing? What are you sowing into your marriage? God has given us the tools. And you see, the reason why a lot of people don't want to sow is because these days people don't read the Bible. There was a generation, a time, when, when you come to church, they will tell you to just stand here and do Romans 8 from Abby. Or you come to church, you are doing so drill. What happened? Why do we think it's okay to stop reading the word? The word of God is forever. It will be useful forever. It is given to you to create. The same way God said, let there be and there was. You take the word and say, in this marriage, let there be and there will be. Because it is the same power. The same power that God carried, that you carry. You need to understand that. You need to understand that because you are God's child and you speak his word, the word of God in your mouth is just as powerful as the word of God in God's mouth. You need to recognize that. So if your husband is misbehaving, it's not a time to say he's a useless man. You speak the word over him. If your husband is sleeping around, you say no. You, you will drink water from your own well. Speak the word over him. Not that useless man where everything is seen. I need to sleep with. Amen. Maybe that's what we should be doing for you. Everything you say into your mind, maybe you should say an amen at the end. Then you will know what you should say and what you should not say. God has given you the word. What are you sowing into your marriage? And I think a lot of us really underestimate the power of God's word. Jesus said, when you want to build. In fact, let's read the scripture. Matthew 7 from verse 24 to 27. I think we underestimate the power of the word. And I think that that's what God wants to remind us of. You need to go back to the word of God. You need to go back to the word of God. You need to go back to the word of God. You need to go back and take what, whatever God said concerning your mind is what you need to take. Stop listening to the world. Stop listening to circumstances around you. Stop listening to situations around you. Stop listening to in-laws. Stop listening to friends. Stop listening. Listen to God. God's voice must be the loudest voice in your marriage. There's no rocket science to this. Because every time people are always going, what's the secret of your marriage? There's no secret. The secret is that there's no secret. If you do God's word, you will have the same results. That's it. People ask me all the time, what's the secret? I, what's the secret to marriage? In my, I don't have a secret to marriage. The only secret I know is stay in the word, obey the word, and God will come true for you. 
Because once you found it, there shall be a reward. I'm telling you. We need to send people back to the word. People are always looking for formulas. Always looking for what, what are the two steps to three steps to first. Stop it. Go and read your Bible. You see there. Stop it. Everything you're looking for is in the word. How you should behave is in the word. How your husband should behave is in the word. How you should treat in-laws is in the word. It's all there. But we don't want to read it. How can somebody give us a manual? Send his, he sent his prophet to interpret the manual. We know he had that one. He now sent his son. Not only to, 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 to interpret the manual, but to rewrite the manual for us. So that it is easier. We still don't want to hear that one. Because sometimes we don't understand the value of what Jesus did for us. If we were still living in those olden days of the, the law, we're not going to survive now. How many of us will make heaven? Sometimes I think that Jesus even made it too easy. That's our problem. Because like say, yeah, some of us go still sit up. Matthew 7. That's why people should thank God I'm not Jesus. If I be Jesus, nobody go make him. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, because in the first place, I'm not, sh- I'm not even sure I would die like that. <laughs> that. No, let me leave it. Because, <laughs> because as I'm going there, I would just, somebody would just say, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? I would just turn. No, 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 no. Touch who you did talk to. <laughs> I, I just want to know. <laughs> me, I save others. Even if I forgive that one, the one way goes spits for my face. Oh no. oh, no. And I know it's one of those people that healed his children. I go first do like this. The bikini go sick. Oh no. <laughs> Let's leave it because <laughs> I'll just say, Lord, I know there's another way. I know there's another way. I will not drink this cup. <laughs> because human beings, human beings are just. Ah. Matthew 7, <laughs> verse 24. He says, these words that I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life. They are not homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. He says, rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. You know, Pastor Sunday was talking about it. How when a house collapses, it doesn't ask permission. It doesn't say, please, how should I collapse? The house will just collapse. And that's what happens if you all you do is come to church. Everything that you hear in church, you just use our Bible study. If I use it to impress each other, what does Matthew 7, 24 say? Oh, no, you don't know in the book of James chapter 1, verse 2. Oh, you don't know. You are doing that, but you are not living the word. It will show. It will show. Jesus said the word of God is actually for you to work into your life. Every area of your life. You should use it for every single area of your life. How should I react when my husband is angry with me? It's in the word. When my husband is shouting, what should I do? It's in the word. If I want to attract the right kind of man, what should I do? It's in the word. A beautiful face on an empty head. All these guys have you do fashion, fashion, fashion. Not inside here. The head is empty. Nothing. The wig is expensive, but the, the, the brain that is carrying the wig. Mba. It's in the word. It's in the word. And I mean, if Solomon, a man who has gone through many women, tells you this, take it to the bank. You see, see, the way you build determines how, whether what you are building will last. And what you build on determines whether what you are building will last. Everybody is building. Everybody. Whether consciously or unconsciously. Everybody is building. And sometimes the picture of what has been, the family we're coming from, what we saw them building there, can affect you. So the trauma you are carrying from your family can affect you. Interestingly, it can do one of two things. It can make you resolve that I must have a good marriage. If you're coming from a broken home or a bad home, you can make up your mind that, oh, I'm going to have a good marriage. Or 
it will make you have to marriage. When they just be married, they say, mm, marriage. I beg, I beg, I beg. I don't want to die quick. So everybody's building. But what you are building is determined by what you want to use it for. So when God expects you to build on the rock, the reason why he's asking you to build on the rock is because the marriage he's asking you to build is the one he can use for his glory. God wants kingdom marriages. That's what he wants. That's what he's after. And there's a difference between ordinary marriage and kingdom marriage. Oh. Ordinary marriage, we can do anything we want to do. As far as our names are written together, we sign a contract. A kingdom marriage brings God glory. A kingdom marriage is about God, not about us. A kingdom marriage is about build, raising godly seed. A kingdom marriage is two people asking themselves, why did God bring us together? There's a reason. There's always a reason why God brings you together. And your decisions, your intentional decisions are the things that will help you achieve what God has brought you together for. A kingdom marriage is built to last. I remember watching a series, and I've shared this in a couple of places, but it has such an effect on me that I think I should share it here tonight. There's a series, I, I like all these medieval, old English, old English, all these old um, medieval movies, you know. So I was watching this particular series, I can't even remember which one, whether it's The Crown or so, I can't remember, one of the, I don't think it's The Crown. Maybe the story of, uh, I can't remember, one of these old mo movies. And there was this boy who was to be king, and this girl who, who was from another kingdom. Um, he, this guy was supposed to be king of England, and I think the girl was from France or something. But you know how those days, their marriages were more contra, like, you marry so that they, if there's war, these people will give us some hair kind of thing. So these two people had fallen in love. Unfortunately, she was not able to give him an heir. And then there was war. There was war approaching or something. So the boy's father wanted him to marry another kingdom from another kingdom where they were really strong. And so the girl was crying. And she was, you know, the guy was saying, I can't, I can't marry. And she was like, don't you love me? And the guy turned to her and said, in, don't you know that we don't, hey <laughs> God, my age as well. He said, we don't marry for love. We marry for God, for kingdom, and for duty. Ah, I pause. I say unbelievers say they don't marry for love. They marry for God, for kingdom, and for duty. Then me, born again me, that Jesus died for, went to hell, fought Satan, disgraced him, collected the keys of death and hell, I came out and rose again. And walked about so that nobody can say my Jesus did not die. Walked about, showed everybody himself. And then when he was leaving hell, he told Satan, you see this girl, he's near him. Eh, I'll deal with you. Then me, and I want to marry. I say it's love that marry. How can you marry be just because of love? What's that? These people say marriage is for God, for kingdom, and for duty. That's what a kingdom marriage is. We marry first for God. Mm. I know when he looks into your eyes, you can't control yourself. Oh, my God. <laughs> God, as this boy, they do me like that. And I saw they do you. <laughs> yes. Because he may be after your heart, but is he a man after God's heart? <laughs> and ladies, listen. Your heart must be so hid in Christ that a man has to first get to Jesus before he can get to you. Say for God, for kingdom, and for duty. That's why we cannot marry unbelievers. We marry for kingdom. We marry to strengthen our kingdom. Mm. We don't go and bring somebody that will weaken our kingdom. Bring agents of darkness. Satan threw them into our kingdom. See, Pastor Sam, you don't know him. He's very nice. Last time I checked, nice is not a fruit of the spirit. Say, ah, Pasem, ah, Pasem, you don't, ah, you don't understand. The guy is very hot. And so is hell. <laughs> so we marry for kingdom. There's a reason. We strengthen the kingdom of God. The person you should marry should be somebody who understands kingdom as well. That we're here to expand God's domain here on the earth. That everything I do should bring God glory. I shouldn't have to be speaking. I'm using my energy to be telling you. Do you know the Bible said? Do you know the Bible said? Where we are supposed to be? We're at war. 
I'll first stop what I'm doing to be saying the Bible say. Oh, God, you know what the Bible say. Let's be moving. Uh-uh. When you marry, you either marry a prayer point or a prayer partner. Which one do you want? Every day, you, every day. I know women that every day. My God, my husband, my husband, my husband, my husband, my husband. You know what get money. You know what make your children prosper. You don't want to use a prayer to do anything great in life. My husband, my husband, my husband. Kilo day, kilo day, kilo day. What's happened? What's the problem? You don't want to marry the one that you just be speaking to Jesus. Father, I just thank you for the man that you've given me. I thank you because I, I know he's destined for greatness. I, you don't want to speak for every Jesus. You want to be doing, oof, Baba. Hey, what's happened? He said, Lord, oh, the groanies. <laughs> groanies, I cannot describe you, Lord. What's happened? I don't, honestly, I know that a lot of people like to suffer, but I don't know why. If you marry well, prayer will be sweet. There are some days, self, eh, you don't even, I mean, there are days, eh, Pastor will just come, just lie down from behind, just hold me and be praying tongues in my ears. That's the most romantic something in my life. You don't like that type. The one that you're praying in tongues, you say, what's that? You want to pray in tongues, and your husband will just say, hmm, I sense that what the Spirit of God is saying through you. Hey! Is it not, that's, it's not, not sweet in you. Don't like that type. Ah, girl. I just say, we marry for kingdom and for duty. There's an assignment on this face of the earth. We're too busy wasting time. Too busy wasting time. And let me tell you, when you want to pray, I'll just give you five things and I'll go because I don't pass okay to call my time. So number one, if you're going to get <laughs> if you're going to have a kingdom marriage, first thing you need to do is count the cost. Be intentional about it. Do you think you have what it takes? This person that you want to spend the rest of your life with, do you think they have what it takes? Would they reach halfway and say they are not doing it again? Because kingdom marriage means that we'll do it God's way. And sometimes, because we live in this world, God's marriage, God's way is hard. Sometimes your partner will offend you. God say, go and apologize. The God will even tell you, forgive. You say, he didn't apologize. God said, I never said anything about apology. Forgive. In fact, that you must not keep any record of wrong. That's kingdom way. Can you do it? If you know you cannot do it, leave, leave the person. Don't go there. Because some people, they see good sin. They will just go there. Oh, this girl is amazing. She's spiritual. She's spiritual. Then you will go there and go and use your demonic power and press her. So the first thing, count the cost. Because it takes intentionality for marriage to work. The second thing, consider what foundation you are building on. The Bible says if foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It starts from source. Before you even get married, for those of you who are still single, start from there. And for those of you who are married, you can start again, right? Together. Not that any, when I say you can start again, somebody says, oh, thank God. How come God's be going? This marriage is not time. No. No. You can make up your minds and say, today, we are starting afresh. We're going to do it God's way. We're letting go of everything that has happened in the past. We will do what we need to do. If we need to get counseling, we will do it. So consider the foundation. Be sure that you are building on God. Listen, build on God. Don't build on marriage. I will let you think about that. Build on God. Don't build on marriage. God is the only one that cannot fail. Marriage can shake. If you are not in the mood, you are tired, you can leave. But you see God, if you build on God, God will not let. If God is the third fold or in that uh, third fold cord, your marriage can never be broken. The third thing, if your marriage is going to be a kingdom marriage, cement it with discipline. Hmm. Whether you like it or not, self-control is a fruit of the spirit that you will need throughout your marriage. Whether it is in av- preventing yourself from saying the wrong things to your partner, because sometimes you will just say, just don't say anything. You say, no, 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 no. If I let this slide, the Holy Spirit say, I'm telling you, just don't say anything. You say, mm, Holy Spirit, see, I've been with this man for 18 years. I know him. If I allow him to go away, we escape with this one. The one he will do next. The Holy Spirit say, don't say anything. Listen, it will take self-control. Not just your love for God. Self-control for your husband to pass you and do that same thing again. And as you want to open your mouth, you say, I don't say anything. You just say, shalom. <laughs> and be going. It is the same discipline that you use not to say anything. That's the same discipline that when a woman passes you naked, you will use also to say, ah. 
I will not look at this one. Shalom. You'll be going. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Because he knew that men are visual beings. He knew that if I look, I'll be in trouble. He said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look on a woman. King David, sir, did not know that. He stood on balcony. I looked on the woman that was buffing her own jejeo. He saw her, he sent for her. They brought him to her house. He looked at her. He said, let me take a closer look in the bedroom. And that's how King David caused problems in his life. Because of a lack of self-discipline. In the first place, you shouldn't be. Discipline will keep you from being where you should not be. The Bible says it was at the time when kings were at war. That King David was at home. What was he doing, sir? Discipline. If your marriage is going to be a kingdom marriage, discipline. Discipline. The same scripture tells us that a man without self-control is like a city without walls. So anything can go in and come out. Self-discipline, small, small things. It's not everything that passes you eat, whether physical, spiritual, emotional, or sexual. Selah. <laughs> the final thing. <laughs> Number four. I do, see, my time don't go. Number four. Minus eight. Nah, no. They will not invite me again. Number four. <laughs> cover it with prayer. When you are building, the building must have a roof. It must have a roof. And you see, the roof, every time I think about the roof in the Bible, every time I, I mean, I relate, when I read the Bible, I try to think about um, where else have I seen this mentioned. Or One of the things I've noticed about the roof is that the roof is like a place of prayer and a place where miracles happen. So, you know, when Jesus was preaching and then there was this, there was this guy that had four friends, the guy was a leper. And he, no, it was not a leper, it was parale, parale, paralytic. Thank you. He was paralytic, he was not a leper. And his friends carried him there and they couldn't find a way in. You know what they did? They went on top of the roof and they cut the roof and dropped the guy. That's a place of miracles, a place of solution. The same Bible tells us that Peter, Apostle Peter was up on the roof and he was praying and then he had a vision. You see, there's a way you will be on the roof. The roof is the place where you see, but you need to cover it with prayer. You cannot, I don't know about other people, let me say my own. I believe, let me say it like this. I believe that you cannot do marriage without prayer. I don't think so. Because, let me tell you, eh, pray, and I don't mean prayer that is reporting your partner to God. I did that for the first couple of months in my marriage until one day God told me, what, what are you doing? He said, and the Holy Spirit, tell you that's why I talk the way I do, because the Holy Spirit said they talk to me anyhow. <laughs> I was praying, you know, I was saying, God, this is your son. It's you that gave him to me. If not, because why would somebody do this? Why would somebody do this? Lord, you have to rise up and allow your enemies to be scattered. <laughs> and Jonas would say, what, what, what are you doing? I say, how? He said, what, what exactly are you doing? This thing I do, what are you doing? I say, I'm praying. <laughs> he said, what's that? I say, I'm praying. You, this man, no. It's after I had one I said, my name. You said he's the youngest. He's taking care of the sheep. I rise, I'm 94, he's the one. You had one that said, my name. You are complaining about him. There's a difference between praying about your husband and praying for your husband. What you need to do, because you have been praying about him for months now, has anything changed? I'm asking you people too. How markets? Every day you wake up and say, God, this man is this, this man is that. Has he changed? No. God now taught me that there's a way you can pray for. So go into the scriptures and begin to write out everything you want this man to be. So I started that journey. I started writing. I write it too. And if you annoy me, I'll say you are you answer. <laughs> you deal with me with understanding. Therefore, your prayers are not hindered in the name of Jesus. Kingsley, you deal with me with understanding. You understand me in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and the sister will come on this show and say, which kind of selfish prayer is that? I say, now you know. Is in the scripture. So he will deal with me with understanding because his prayers will, because if the way they feel now, if prayer feel him down, his prayer will not be hindered. In the name. And I started, honestly, I started praying for my husband. I started speaking over him this, this, the word of God. And I would declare over him that you would be like Job, the richest man in the East. You will be like, ah, the prayer I don't pray on top of my head. 18 years. 
<laughs> I, at some point, I realized that God was actually pointing me in the direction of something that a lot of us were missing. Because all the wives I knew were praying about their husband. All of us are you praying about? We're praying about him. We're praying. You are complaining. Your husband did this thing. I said, go to God. Go and report him. And it wasn't making any, it wasn't changing anything. We'll come out of there and the man will even do worse. And you will say, I'm praying. I'm praying. In fact, it's when I'm even praying, the man is even worse. Because you are not praying the right way. God did not say when he came out and everywhere was dark, there was darkness and everywhere was uh, uh, devoid. <laughs> the English. You see what? You know what I'm saying in the beginning, Sha? I cannot, it's not, it's not the, the, the scripture is not scripture in my head. God did not come there and start saying, ah, why is there darkness upon the deep? Oh, why is there, oh me, why is there darkness upon the deep? Oh, let there not be darkness on, upon the deep now. I'm not really happy about the fact that there's darkness upon the deep. <laughs> he got there, saw the situation. Light. Your husband is badly behaved. Declare by him you have sense. <laughs> That's what you do. Just enter the place of prayer. Don't focus on what he's not doing. Curate the man you want. You know the way you do unpack. You put what you want inside. Exactly, you carry baskets and you start declaring, this man, this is how you are. You are wise. People, come, nations come to your lips for wisdom. You sit at the city gates with the fathers, with the elders. That means that anytime there's a meeting in this nation, the top five people, your name must be mentioned. You, that's how you be declaring it. That the nations are open to you. Every, in fact, it's impossible for you to enter a nation and they don't receive you. Declare platform, begin to... De wealth is blessed in... Every currency, not this man is a useless. Why is he so poor? Why is he so poor? I don't suffer. I don't have for this sofa. God, I don't have for this sofa. Show me mercy. Lord, show me me mercy. We don't show you since Jesus died on the cross. You will do something with that. You will go to God and you will declare that this man is blessed in every currency. Men and women, sons and daughters come from afar to meet him with silver and gold. You will declare over him what you want. You will create, because what you have been doing since is not working. And they say the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. So if we have been doing it since it's not working, should we not do it a different way? And so that was how many years ago, the very first year, a few months into our marriage, I started praying for my husband and I stopped praying about him. And today, I can tell you categorically that almost all the prayers that I have prayed over this man I'm seeing them today. He's become the man God wants him to be. That's duty. The marriage is for God, for kingdom, and for duty. Were you blessed this evening? Can you rise to your feet? We're going to pray a quick prayer. Just one. I don't know. For those who are single, your own naive and sweet pass. Because you can curate the man that you want. You can create the woman that you want. For those of us that are married, we have to start praying for and stop praying about. So we're going to take one minute. I'm just going to pray for your partner. If you are here, husband and wife, I want you to hold your partner's hand. If you are standing together, hold your partner's hand. If you are, if you are engaged, Nana won't catch all those single boys where they lie. <laughs> if you are in a relationship, please hold the person's hand. If he does not hold your hand, let me tell you this, another game. Pastor, I'm scattered your relationship. I'm the one that scattered it. And if you are single, you are going to hold Jesus and raise your hand to heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you are going to declare and begin to speak and begin to curate the partner that you want. So I want you to just open your mouth and begin to pray. For some of us, you know not how to pray as you ought to because you don't even know what you need. So you're praying tongues. Let the Holy Spirit pray for you, through you. So I want you to open your mouth and begin to pray tonight. And begin to declare what you want to see over your partner, whether male or female. Begin to declare what you want to see, the kind of person that you want to marry. One minute. One minute is all I have. One. One minute. Open your mouth and pray. I need you to pray this with seriousness. Your wife is shy. Declare that she's bold. She's strong and courageous. 
Mendele Kade Shata, E Yalika Tose Neki Ala Kade, Rekete Elevo Shata, Arya Manda Dadi Kelede, Salaya Bo Shata, Adia Mando Koza, the man sleeps around, declare now, declare now that he has self control, and a Yile Kede that he drinks water from his own well, Amba Di Kelede, Rata Daye Helika Doza, Etia Labo Shatani Amande Gede, Rakatani Ala Kadika Doza, Elia Bano Dose Kelly Amanda. Ibratosha tali amande gede de de Ribatosa ki alada Imatosa 30 seconds 30 seconds is all you need Ada yikele de de Yabado sakali amamra hale gede Edu kataya le mahande gede Rat Tosa da yale kadisha Declare speak life into your home Speak life into your home Speak life into your home Ebralisha ta The Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead He says if it dwells within your mortal body It will quicken, it will quicken Ada yile osha Which means it will bring life Declare life in your homes Life in your marriages Life, life, speak life Ada yikalu shata Ebrate kadisha ta yale de de Rada da yabo shata yale de if you are divorced, declare that affliction shall not rise again. And they can Ibra holiday shata e kariaboza now. Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. We declare that everything we have said so shall it be in the name of Jesus. We declare tonight that we receive wisdom to build the kind of homes that you want us to build. We declare that from today we realign our vision with yours and from today our marriages become for God, for kingdom and for duty. For in Jesus name we pray. Amen. God bless you.